You're listening to the Odds Cast, the original UFC betting podcast that's straight to the point. Hosted by leading MMA odds maker Nick Kalikas and MMA journalist Brian Hemminger, they provide you the absolute best UFC betting info, picks, statistics, and analysis from the most respected authority in mixed martial arts betting. MMAoddsbreaker.com. Don't place your wagers without us. Welcome to the Oddscast, presented by BetDSI. I'm Brian Hemminger, joined today by leading mixed martial arts odds maker Nick Kalikas to break down this Saturday's UFC on ESPN Plus 27 event, which takes place in Norfolk, Virginia. If you're unfamiliar with our format, Nick and I will break down the fight card from top to bottom, providing extensive analysis and a pick for each fight after doing our film study for the event. Looking back, Kyle Marley won 2.4 units for UFC on ESPN Plus 26 after going 2-1 and one on his premium bets. Kyle has his bets and fantasy MMA picks available now on MMAOddsbreaker.com. Back to the present, UFC on ESPN Plus 27 features a 12-fight card in total and will be aired exclusively on ESPN Plus this Saturday night. Let's dive right in. And just as a reminder, uh, with uh, this podcast being put out a little bit later than normal, we're going to be trying to go through it a little quicker than normal, uh, just so we can get it out to everybody. So, kicking things off in the welterweight division, we have Ismail Nardiev, who is 19-3, and taking on Sean Brady, who is 11-0. and Now, Nick, where did this fight open, and how has the public shifted things so far? All right, a couple quick shout-outs again before we get going here real quick. BetDSI.eu, that's our sponsored sportsbook. Those are the updated lines that I will be quoting, so make sure you guys head over to BetDSI.eu, check them out. We appreciate their sponsorship. Also, head over to MMAOddsBreaker.com, click on the Premium Picks tab, and check out Big Marley 3's MMA plays. He's got five plays this weekend that you could buy separately or package them all together as well. So five UFC bets for this card, some really solid plays. Um, and again, the guy's been up over 240 units in the last two years, basically less than two years, a little bit less than two years or so um, on fire. I mean, the guy's quality overall, you know, off and on, obviously you're never going to win them all, but uh, in long term, he definitely provides great results. And that's why he's the man right now. So head over to MMAosberger.com, click on the premium picks tab and grab a package. He also has DraftKings available as well. All right, now getting right into this card. I mean, to start things off with Brady and Nardioff, I mean, what kind of craziness is that? This should not be an opening bout, I would say, uh, because I think the level of these guys is definitely highly skilled. So hats off to the UFC for starting us off with such a good fight here as well. And again, a fight that I think is going to be relatively competitive. Uh, Nardioff opened minus 150, the comeback on Brady plus 120. And right now what we're seeing over at Bet DSI is currently minus 116 for Nardi off the comeback, minus 103 for Brady. So line marks have tightened up a little bit. Two action is coming in this fight, despite a little bit of early action coming in Brady's way. Or Nardi off is getting some action back his way as well. Um, and it should be an interesting fight. Like I said, I'm, I'm glad that Brady is getting some decent respect because I think he deserves it at this point. Nardi off is kind of the more established UFC veteran at this point of his career as well. So I know he's had a little bit of a up and down ride thus far. I mean, coming in with your debut, beating a guy like Prezeris, then having a setback against the encounter, but bouncing back and getting a solid win over Sire. So th- that's an interesting career, short career to say the least for Nardioff, but you've seen his skill set. I mean, the guy's definitely a complete fighter. He's good everywhere the fight takes place. He's got that unorthodox but clean striking technique that you have to worry about on the feet for sure. He's got wrestling ability. He's got takedown defense for the most part. That does get him in trouble at times though as well. So very good fighter. Uh, Brady on the other hand, um, you can say a lot of the same things. He is obviously the new blood kind of coming to the UFC. He looked impressive in his UFC debut over Corn McGee. He showed us what he ma- he's made of there. He's got a pretty solid wrestling background with the boxing ability to do some serious damage on the feet pushes a high pace as well and has wrestling like i said to back it up with a good grappling ability and ground awareness so this is a very good fight i could see it realistically playing out either way it's a pick em type of fight for me and basically at the sports books right now as well i'm gonna side with brady um i think it's a dog or pass situation i think that brady will push the pace as the fight goes maybe mixes in a takedown or two i think this fight's going to take place all over the cage and we'll see it kind of go back and forth, but I think Brady's going to do enough to edge it out. So my pick, Sean Brady, dogger pass. And I'll come in the other way. I just like Nardiev. I think uh he's going to put that loss to Rencounter behind him. And, and realistically, that loss to Rencounter, basically he was smashing him and he just got a little tired and Rencounter was able to get some takedowns and get top position and uh eke out a decision. Um I don't think that that's going to be the case here. Brady's a lot better defensively than run counter. 
Uh, Nardiev is going to be a little bit more cautious. Um, these guys are very evenly matched, but I just think Nardiev is a little bit more diverse uh, of a striker. I think that he's got a little bit more power and I think uh, Nardiev's takedown defense is going to be just fine because he's a pretty good wrestler himself. As long as he doesn't get tired, he should win this fight. So I'm going to side with Nardiev. I just think he's going to do too much, and Brady gets that first L. Now, moving down to the featherweight division, we have Elon Cruz, who is eight and two, taking on Spike Carlisle, who is eight and one. Now, Nick. What's the MMA oddsmaker's perspective on this one? Cruz open minus 130. Carlisle, even money. And right now what we're seeing over at BetDSI is currently Cruz coming in at minus 189. The comeback, plus 157 on Carlisle. So more action coming in Cruz's way from the opening price. I mean, size difference right away stands out to me. I mean, he's he's definitely going to have the size advantage. He's a long guy, um, has some pretty good striking has a pretty good well-rounded game overall. And I think that, you know, he's obviously put that on display um, recently as well in the UFC contender series, but he's a little bit flawed and I'm not that comfortable supporting him at this spot. So the people that are betting Cruz up, I understand maybe at a pick type of price while you guys are going that way, but Carlisle definitely has some attributes here that could give Cruz a lot of problems. I mean, Carlisle is physically strong. He's going to be the shorter fighter a little bit, but he does have a wrestling base as well with a little bit of power on the feet. Um, he's fast. He's explosive. So I think this fight could realistically go back and forth as well. Um, I think Cruz probably stuffs the takedowns and does a little bit more damage. He might even end up on top on the ground. Carlisle has been put on his back um, as well. So both these guys, again, just are flawed, and it should be a competitive fight. I mean, these guys are obviously you know, getting their shot. They're going to be hungry to come in here and prove that they belong. Um, so it should be an exciting fight. I just think that Cruz probably physically has a little bit more of an advantage with his skill set, with his tools, everything that he brings to the table here, but I'm not confident in it. So those of you guys that are confident in Cruz, I think you're heading in the right direction, but I wouldn't bet it, especially at this price at this point. So I'm staying away from it, but I will pick Cruz to get it done. And I'm also going to come in on Cruz. Uh, I was pretty impressed with his performance on Contender Series. He was able to go deep into the third round and then get a late finish with a pretty impressive flying knee. So he's also a guy that has a lot of size and length in this fight, and he knows how to use it pretty well, especially uh, being a big featherweight. That's going to give him an advantage. And if he can keep Carlisle um, at distance, I think he just picks him apart with uh, some good range attacks. And he's got a few tricks up his sleeve if Carlisle does uh, recklessly close the distance. So... Um, I think while Carlisle is uh, pretty tough and he has some power, unless he's able to get inside and really blast Cruz in the phone booth area, I think uh, Cruz just utilizes that size and length and distance and uh, ekes out a decision utilizing uh, his physical tools. So uh, you still we haven't seen a lot out of these guys yet, obviously with neither having made their pro de- uh, UFC debut. But uh, I just think overall Cruz is a little bit more talented and has a little bit more to offer. Now, sticking with the featherweight division, we have Jordan Griffin, who is 17 and 7, taking on TJ Brown, who is 14 and 6. Now, Nick, where did this fight open and how has the public shifted things so far? Griffin open minus 210, the comeback on Brown at plus 170. And right now what we're seeing over DSI is currently Griffin minus 130, the comeback plus 108 on Brown. So line margins have tightened up. More action ain't coming in Brown's way. I understand the action there as well because these guys are, man, it should be quite a competitive fight back and forth. These guys match up relatively well. They have a lot of the same attributes. These guys can both wrestle. They can both throw down on the feet. They have good ground awareness. Just complete fighters that are coming in right now to this fight, really looking for the W here. And I'm saying Brown obviously making his official UFC debut. Um, he looked good on the contender series, got a solid win. Griffin, unfortunately for him, man, I mean, he's lost two tough fights that the UFC has not really done him any favors in. And the Skelly fight in his last fight, Skelly's always difficult. So losing a decision to him is not necessarily a bad thing. And then Ige, of course. I mean, the role that Ige's on has just been phenomenal. So Griffin, this is a step down for him and TJ Brown. But, I mean, it's a step down, but you still have to respect the skill set that Brown has because he can definitely come in here and get the job done and pull off a decision win over Griffin. I think this will go back and forth. And, again, it'll play out 
every which way possible. I think both guys will get top position on the ground at a certain uh, time. I think both these guys are going to be competitive back and forth on the feet. I'm going to say Griffin edges it out. I think it's going to be a split decision type of fight. And it is a tough one, again, at the betting window to bet. So early action coming in on Brown, I understand it. That was the way to go. Where it is right now, I think the line's probably about right. So I'm going to pick Griffin to get it done. Um, but I think he just edges it out. So be careful if you're betting this one. And I'll come in the other way again. Uh, I, I've been impressed with Brown. Now, obviously, for Griffin, this is a little bit of a step down in competition, considering he faced uh, two really talented featherweights in Chaz Skelly and Dan Ige. But uh, he still did drop decisions to those fighters. And uh, in TJ Brown, he's facing somebody that has uh, some good finishing ability, somebody with a lot of confidence. Um Looked good in his contender series fight with a knockdown and a submission, uh, to earn that contract. Um, I feel like Brown's just entering this fight with a lot of momentum. So, um, and as Nick mentioned, these guys are very evenly matched. Both have good wrestling. Both are good on the ground. Both are pretty talented on the feet. Uh, but overall, I think, uh, Brown has the momentum and unless he has some UFC jitters, and just comes in and is really nervous or uh, gasses out really quick, I think Brown is actually going to be the one that pulls this out. Now, I might be underestimating Griffin because he's 0-2 in the UFC, even though he has faced some good competition. But, uh, you know, momentum means a lot, too. And uh, I think uh, while both of these guys are very evenly matched, uh, you've got one guy coming in with some confidence and some and another one that's doubting himself a little bit. So I'm going to side with Brown. Now, moving all the way up to the heavyweight division, we have Marcin Tibura, who is 17 and 6, taking on Sergei Spivak, who is 10 and 1. Now, Nick, what's the MMA oddsmaker's perspective on this one? This fight opened exactly a pick. Tibura minus 115, Spivak minus 115. And right now what we're seeing... Over at DSI is currently Spivak minus 115, the comeback on Tabura minus 104. So a lot of more kind of have tightened up a little bit, especially DSI right now. You're getting basically a 19 cent line margin um, in one of their sports books. So check them out for sure. That's a pretty good price. Um, now getting into the fight, it's tough. I can't believe Tabura is even this close, to, to be honest with you. I mean, a, a few fights back, we thought this guy was a legit contender. Now he seems like he's a shell of himself. So you cannot trust what you see from Tabura, and you have to kind of lean Spivak's way here, I think, because he is the guy on momentum. I know, you know, obviously he got blasted not too long ago, and you have to respect that a little bit, and you have to be um, a little bit cautious with Spivak on the feet a little bit, but Tabura hasn't really shown us that in the last few fights. He does have knockout power. He does. He is a talented fighter, but I think Spivak's actually a little bit more dangerous in this spot here. I think he's going to be the one that's a little bit more aggressive. He's is the more complete mixed martial art artist right now at this point, uh, because like I see, I, I think Tabura is on the decline a little bit. And Spivak, despite, you know, having his ups and downs, he did bounce back and get a, a very solid win in his last fight. Um, he showed us a little bit more in that fight. So he shows up here confident. Tabura, not really that confident. I mean, we don't know where his head's at. We don't know where really his conditioning everything across the board he just like i said doesn't look good so i'm gonna roll with spivak here only because of momentum I, it's hard to bet this fight for me because i think both these guys are flawed and again tabura shows up like he was a few fights back he could definitely win this fight so be cautious here but as far as a pick goes i'll go with momentum but another one that is very tricky at the betting window and i feel the same way i mean in terms of pure talent tabura is probably the better fighter here he's you know he's scored head kick knockouts. He's had a decent ground game as when he was on, coming into the UFC, but uh, it just really feels like he's on his way out of the UFC at this point. He's a one in four in his last five fights. He's been finished three of those four losses. Um, I mean, his confidence is just at an all time low. Now Spivak isn't exactly a guy that was just creaming world beaters uh, to, to earn his way to the UFC. I mean, he beat guys like Travis Fulton and Tony Lopez. Um, but, uh, and then in his UFC debut, he got smoked by Walt Harris in less than a minute. But that last performance against Tui Vasa was pretty impressive. Um, you know, obviously Tui Vasa is probably not as good as we thought he was, but still, um, Tui Vasa was favored in that fight. And, uh, Spivak was able to, uh, turn the tables on him and get a finish against Tui Vasa, a very tough guy in the second round. 
Um, so I think, uh, you know, Spivak has a little bit more momentum here, even though maybe technically he's probably not as good. Um, Spivak's, uh, got some power. He's got some ability. He's got a little bit of momentum, some confidence. And, uh, like Nick said, Tibura's fading. Um, he just really does not look like that same guy that entered the UFC at, with, uh, some momentum and picked up some quality wins and actually headlined a UFC event at one point. So, I mean, this is almost a shell of that, that fighter. So I feel like, uh, you know, if this was a year or two ago, then Tibora, I definitely pick, but this time around, I'm going to pick Spivak. Now, dropping down to the lightweight division, we have Luis Pena, who is 7-2, and two, taking on Steve Garcia Jr., who is 11-3. Now, Nick, where did this fight open, and how has the public shifted things so far? Pena opened minus 330, the comeback on Garcia plus 270, and right now what we're seeing over at DSI is currently Pena minus 263, the comeback on Garcia at plus 210. So again, another spot where lines have tightened up a little bit. More action coming in on Garcia. That's the right way to go early on, man. You got two quality fighters going out of here as well. Garcia coming in here, I think, man, he has a lot of skill. He has a lot of confidence going right now as well. Um, and he's a handful for everybody, man. I mean, he just, he's one of these guys that can obviously sprawl, brawl, keep the fight upright if he needs to, uh, land some heavy shots on the feet. He's got good fight IQ. There's just a lot to like about him right now. He trains at a good camp with uh, Jackson's MMA, of course, as well. He's going to be prepared, and it's going to be a tough fight for Pena. But that said, he's taking this fight on short notice. And Luis Pena, in my opinion, has been one of the most difficult matchups for a lot of people. I mean, whether it was a featherweight briefly tried to, you know, get down there, didn't work, quite work out for him. But that said, I mean, his even his size at lightweight, I mean, the long frame that he has, he's got more power than kind of he looks like at times as well. So that said, he's also that unorthodox grappling ability and that style that he has. Um, he could be effective on the feet as well. Um, so it's hard not to like Pena in this matchup because I think he could just mix everything up, um, chain everything together a little bit better and, and keep up the pace as the fight progresses and probably um, outwork Garcia, maybe even find a finish along the way, even though Garcia is not going to be an easy guy to finish. Um, so this is going to be fireworks. And again, at the opening odds, it was definitely a dog or pass situation. But I do think Pena wins this fight. I think he just is going to be too much for Garcia to step in on short notice. I think he's going to absorb too much along the way. And Pena is just going to either edge him out or maybe even, like I said, finish him along the way. So I do like Pena to win this fight. Fight. I think the guy's kind of, like I said, a freak for this weight class in a lot of ways. And if he continues to improve, he's going to be a handful for a lot of people. But Garcia, if he does get this loss, don't count him out, man. This guy's going to also bounce back, and he's going to win some fights in the UFC. There's no doubt. So I'm glad that these guys are matched up, and they're going to throw down because it should be a quality fight. I'm going to pick Pena to win, though. Major props to Garcia. I mean, this guy is uh really gutsy stepping in to take on a really tough fighter like Luis Pena on crazy short notice. Um Garcia is another he's a big long fighter as well, but typically he fights at featherweight. Um and he uh is a very talented uh long striker, um has some power. He uh, stepped in on short notice again in a LFA uh, and had an impressive performance as well. Um, and he's actually tried to fight at Bantamweight before, despite being about six feet tall. So, um, he's actually going to be in a, 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 an awkward position of actually being the smaller fighter because he's fighting at lightweight. So, uh, that being said, um, while Garcia is really talented and he has enough power to potentially knock Pena out if he really cracks him, um, I, I just think Pena is going to be bigger, longer, way better prepared for this fight. Um, he's going to have, uh, you know, that really diverse, unorthodox striking style with some sneaky power, despite his really long frame. And he mixes in a great ground game. So there's really not a lot to say about this. Uh, you know, Pena was, uh, supposed to face, I think, uh, uh, who was it? Alex Munoz. And, uh, that would have been a really fun fight, but. Uh, you know, this should still be a fun fight, even though Garcia is fighting out of his weight class on short notice. Um, he's not going to be like dwarfed and, um, it should just be a, a good scrap. But, you know, Pena is definitely the more experienced, uh, more technically sound fighter, but don't count Garcia out. He does have a puncher's chance and he does have the power to potentially 
end this fight if Pena is taking him lightly. But my pick is still going to be Pena. Now, moving up to the middleweight division, we have Brandon Allen, who is 13 and 3, taking on Tom Brees, who is 11 and 1. Now, Nick, what's the MMA oddsmaker's perspective on this one? Allen open minus 140, Breeze plus 110. And what we're seeing right now over at BetDSI is minus 135 for Breeze, the comeback plus 113 on Allen. So a lot of people were surprised that Allen opened a slight favorite here. A lot of action coming in Breeze's way, and it's been going back and forth. And there's a ton of action coming in on this fight overall because we have a lot of split opinions on this fight as far as sharp action goes. A lot of sharp action coming in on Breeze moving the line back up to where it is now. Um, and then at some point where it gets to plus 10, plus 15, sharp action's coming back and hitting Allen as well. So, I mean, like I said, two ways sharp action on this fight. It should be a doozy. I mean, I think it's interesting, and, and it's hard to predict how this is totally going to play out, obviously, because, I mean, there's just so many question marks surrounding Breeze mainly, I think, more than anything else. For me, I like what I see with Allen. I mean, I'll, I'll just get right to the point with him. I know you could see his ups and downs a little bit um, on Access TV with LFA and when he was in the promotion. I mean, he was definitely a good fighter, great fighter, very young still. I believe Allen's only 24 years old, if I'm not mistaken, at this point. What I'm trying to say is you can see the growth and improvement um, throughout his career. He fought very solid competition, and at, at a certain extent, a certain point of his career – after his last loss, he just – something clicked. He's got a little bit more focused. He got motivated, and everything started kind of coming together better for him. And I've never seen him – you know, this little win streak that he's put together, um, I've never seen him better. So the guy is definitely coming into his own. He's getting a lot more confidence. He's mainly – excelling at the ground i mean with his wrestling and with his ground game the most but his stand-up is getting better um all the time i mean he could be effective with that and, and again he changed everything together really well so i like what i see from allen breeze on the other hand of course he's been hyped since he's come into his ufc debut he's been outstanding overall um to a certain extent but he hasn't been consistent he hasn't been fighting as much as we like to see he was fighting at welterweight early on now it's bounced up to middleweight and at middleweight obviously he had a, a pretty impressive win over dan kelly but to me i need to see a little bit more i mean kelly uh, you know an aging guy obviously on the decline of course breeze can mark him up a little bit on the feet there as well so breeze should have the stand-up advantage here because his boxing is pretty sharp um and then of course on the ground he's obviously a very skilled fighter as well i mean he could definitely hold his own with anybody the problem here i have is i think allen probably gets top position more times than not here because he can't breeze is susceptible to those trip type of takedowns and I think he finds himself on his back. But Allen has to be careful because Breeze likes to kind of work himself out um, with those leg lock submission attempts as well and, and scramble, get back on top position. But So this fight is going to definitely be close. It'll take place everywhere it goes. I think Allen's stand-up is going to be a little bit more effective than people realize here because Tom Breeze does like to leave his hands low. And with the inconsistency of Tom Breeze the last few years, honestly, I don't like what I see from him. I like what I see from Allen. I think he's on the upside. So I'm going to go against the public opinion that's kind of put the line where it is now, and I'm going to side with the opening line with Allen actually being a slight favorite. I understand it, and I think momentum is on his side right now. This is going to be the toughest fight of his career by far, but I think he's ready for it, and I like the improvement. So my pick is Allen, and at this point, I think it is a dog or pass situation. You have to side with the plus money here in this fight. And Allen does enter this fight with a lot of hype. Uh he is uh, on a nice little run, had a great performance against Kevin Holland, a pretty established UFC guy in his Octagon debut. He looked good on the Contender Series. He won and defended the LFA middleweight title, so he clearly is a solid uh, UFC fighter here. Uh, the, the the problem is Tom Brees, when healthy, I mean, he was a contender. I mean, he was a player at 170, and then... He was just one of the biggest, scariest 170 pounders in the world and just was too big for the weight class and moved up to middleweight and looked great in at middleweight as well. And he's a pretty good sized middleweight. Um, really what's held Breeze back has been, he just hasn't been very active. Um, I don't think he's fought in about two years. He's pulled out of multiple fights against, uh, you know, Ian Heinish and Cesar Mutante Ferreira. So, um, I, I'm very glad that he's actually competing here because we just haven't seen him in forever. And, you know, he was, he used to train over at TriStar, had a, developed a really nice jab there. Um, he's utilizes his length well. And something a lot of people maybe don't know is he is 
an extremely talented grappler as well. He just doesn't really show it that often because he likes to keep it on the feet where he can light people up with his length and uh, good straight punches. So, um, I mean, this should be a competitive fight. It just boils down to if Brees is rusty or or not, because when Brees is at the top of his game, he's tough to beat for just about anybody. Um, but if he comes in there rusty and, you know, off a step, I could totally see Brandon Allen taking this. But uh, I'm going to assume that Brees wouldn't be fighting if he didn't think that he was just as good and just as capable. Um, so I'm going to go with Brees. Um, I think that he picks up right where he left off and puts in a good performance and ekes out a unanimous decision, uh, a competitive unanimous decision. I wouldn't be shocked to see him lose a round, but I think uh, he'll get enough done to uh, take the, the decision on the judges' scorecards. So, Brees is my pick. Now, dropping down to the Bantamweight division, we have Gabriel Silva, who is 8-1, and one, taking on Kyler Phillips, who is and 6-1. Now, Nick, where did this fight open, and how has the public shifted things so far? Silva opened minus 175, the comeback on Phillips, plus 145. And right now, what we're seeing over at BetDSI is currently Silva minus 130, the comeback plus 109 on Phillips. So obviously, line marks have tightened up with more action coming in Phillips's way. Again, I don't blame people for coming in that way early on. This is going to be an awesome fight. I mean, both these guys definitely have skill in every area of the fight. I think Silva is probably a little bit stronger. I think he's the better grinder. I think he's the better um, overall wrestler in this spot. He's going to go after that. I mean, he's a good striker too as well. So both these guys, again, another spot where they're well-rounded. And of course, I mean, it's 2020. Most of these guys are going to have a complete skill set. And that's what you get here with these guys. But I think Silva's path to victory is kind of slowing uh, Phillips up a little bit. Phillips has some speed. He's got some power. Um, he definitely has some good effective striking. Um, with a well-rounded skill set, like I said. So everywhere the fight takes place, he's going to be game. Not going to be an easy guy to take down. But I think Silva's probably going to do enough to edge a close competitive decision out. Man, a lot of Phillips' fights, if he goes to scorecards, they are 29-28 type of decision, close grinding type of fights. So I think this is going to be another one, honestly. It's a coin flip type of fight. So again, the people that came in early on the plus 145, I understand it. This could be a split decision. Um, and right now, I'm going to slightly lean towards Silva because at a pick em price, I think he does have more ways, I guess, to win this fight and more potential to kind of grind it out and maybe steal a decision here as well. So, But make no mistakes. This should be fireworks. This should be an awesome fight. And I wouldn't be surprised if Phillips gets it done because I think he is phenomenal as well. So both these guys are studs. Looking forward to this fight. My pick is going to be Silva slightly. I think he edges it out barely. Yeah, for me, this one really boils down to whether or not uh, Silva – can uh, hang on with his conditioning because he was looking really good against Ray Borg. And then he just got a little tired and Borg took over, um, ended up losing a decision. Now, Kyler Phillips, um, you know, he was a pretty good contestant on the ultimate fighter season 27, ended up losing to the eventual winner by majority decision, Brad Katona, um, and also lost a split decision to a talented fighter in his first fight after the ultimate fighter. Uh, but he bounced back. Went in there at a LFA um, last February, so a full year ago. But in that LFA fight, he smoked um, uh, his opponent first round head kick and uh, follow up punches uh, to get the win. And he was actually supposed to fight Ray Borg too uh, in March, and uh, that fell through. So uh, because of uh, an injury, so he's been sidelined for quite a while now, and. He's finally ready to fight. So they've got a little bit of a Ray Borg uh, in common, but um, S Gabriel Silva has actually been in there and uh, Phillips has not. And the way I see this fight playing out, I just think Silva is a little bit better in all areas, but except conditioning. Uh, my big fear is Silva starts strong again against Phillips. Phillips and then gases and Phillips takes over and wins a decision. Um, but I think that Silva can do enough to win the first two rounds. And then if he does slow down, I don't think Phillips can get a finish. So 
Um, as long as Silva can eke out those first two rounds, I think he takes a decision. But uh, again, just pay attention a little bit. If he expends way too much energy in the first round, it could be a really interesting live betting scenario. But uh, my pick is going to be Gabriel Silva. Now, moving on to the main card in the featherweight division, we have Grant Dawson, who is 14 and 1, taking on Derek Minner, who is 24 and 10. Now, Nick, what's the MMA oddsmaker's perspective on this one? Dawson opened minus 405 to come back on Minner plus 285. And right now, what we're seeing over at DSI is currently Dawson coming to minus 455 to come back plus 349 on Minner. So another spot, a little bit of action coming in Dawson's way. I'm not surprised. I mean, Dawson is the one that was supposed to be on the card originally and actually – got postponed. Um, he was supposed to be on another card um, with this matchup with uh, Skelly, but uh, all that kind of got sidetracked, of course, with uh, Skelly pulling out. Now Minner steps in here on short notice. Very suitable replacement, though, because Minner's tough, man. He's a savvy vet. has been around for a long time, and he's more than capable of coming in here and doing some good things. So Dawson, I heard interviews of him being overconfident kind of a little bit in this spot. Takes, you know, they, these guys know each other. I mean, through their careers, obviously, before they got the UFC, they've been on the same cards together. They've competed um, you know, obviously close, the same organizations or whatnot as well. So they know each other. And Dawson's very coming to this fight. Minner as, as well. He wants to go out there and pr- uh, prove that he belongs here in the UFC. So this should be a doozy, no doubt. But I think Dawson obviously is a little bit too much for Minner at this point still. I mean, I think, again, Dawson sleeps on this guy. He could be in trouble. Minner definitely has some power. He's got um, some submission ability as well. He's, he's a pretty, again, 2020, well-rounded fighter. There's no doubt. But Dawson, I think, is just a better grinder overall. I think he pushes a higher pace, and he's more than capable of getting this done. Maybe finds a finish along the way as well. But um, it should be interesting as it goes, though. So, I mean, at 4-1, to one, I do think Dawson is the side. I mean, I wouldn't just go out there and go crazy because, again, you got to respect Minner. These savvy vets that are getting their shot in the UFC are hungry. They want to prove a point. And at times, we see them pull off some crazy upsets. I mean, they come in here not expecting to do much and they overperform because again, they know this is their one and only opportunity. So in this spot here, Minner's probably going to fight like it is. And I think he's going to be dangerous, but still hard to uh, go against Dawson here in this spot. I mean, I think sky's the limit for Dawson. He's so such a talented fighter overall. So he should get this job done. So my pick is Dawson. If you're going to bet it though, be careful. Yeah. Really the only thing that has me nervous at all about picking Dawson is the fact that he missed weight today. Um, was not impressed with that, came in uh, three and a half pounds overweight, um, and he, his opponent was the one that was uh, taking the fight on short notice, so that's pretty embarrassing. Um, that being said, um, while Minner does have a lot of experience against good fighters, he doesn't have much experience actually beating those good fighters. I think out of maybe five or six fighters that he's faced that have eventually made to the UFC or formerly fought in the UFC. He's only beat one of them. So uh, not too, too impressed with uh, what I see on Minner's track record. Um, he does have experience, but uh, Grant Dawson is a, a talented fighter, overweight for this fight or not. Um, he has a, a really good ground game. He's dangerous. He has good ground and pound. Um, I think he just gets the wrestling, puts Minner on his back, and uh, finishes him from either top position or with a uh, submission. So Dawson will be my pick. Now, sticking with the featherweight division and moving over to the women's side, we have Megan Anderson, who is nine and four, taking on Norma Dumont, who is four and zero. Oh. Now, Nick, where did this fight open and how has the public shifted things so far? Anderson minus 400, Dumont plus 300. That was the opening line. Right now we're seeing that basically almost cut in half. Minus 244 for Anderson, Dumont plus 197. And again, Anderson, the popular fighter. Anderson, the one that's kind of more in line, obviously, in the featherweight division for a title shot here. Um, Dumont, kind of the unknown coming in, stepping in here. So, of course, Anderson's going to be a solid favorite. That said, I think the early action is right, again, because uh, Dumont at plus 300 odds probably has a little bit of value. She's a very solid fighter. She's strong, physically strong. I know, again, she fights at 135 normally, but still, taking this fight on short notice, she's going to be undersized. She's going to have that to worry about for her. She's a big girl. She's going to have some length on her, but Dumont isn't exactly weak. She's going to be strong as well. 
has some pretty decent striking on the feet. Um, she has some power when she does land. It's just, again, she's going to have to close that distance and try to get around uh, Anderson's length. But I think she's going to be game on the feet. I think, obviously, on the ground, Dumont actually has the advantage here. She's going to want to get this fight to the ground. She has some decent trips, throws, that kind of thing. And that's kind of, you know, Anderson has problems getting um, taken down like that at times as well. So, again, early action coming out of Dumont, justified. I understand a plus 300 price tag. I'm going to pick, as far as a pure pick goes, Anderson to win this fight because, again, she's the one that's getting better, of course. She's the more experienced fighter, been in there with better competition. She realistically should get this job done against Dumont here, but I don't think it's going to be as easy as everybody thinks here, so it's going to be a test for Anderson. So, again, if it was a, a total pick em type of fight, of course, I'm going to lean Anderson. I think she should win it. At the betting window, though, it is a dog or pass situation. I mean, even at this point, you don't lay almost two and a half to one on Anderson because – there's just still too many flaws in her game. I know she's getting better, even off her back. She's capable of, of submitting people. She's constantly improving, has a good camp and good training, good coaching, everything behind her. So, that, I mean, again, you got to love what you're seeing from Anderson. But I just think Dumont is going to come in here and, and be a handful for her, really. So, again, another spot where you do have to be cautious betting this fight. I think Anderson wins, but Dumont's probably going to press, even if she does lose here. So, be careful. Yeah, basically, this fight boils down to whether or not – uh, Dumont can put Anderson on her back. Uh, we know Anderson, that's her weakness on the feet. She's got power. She's got size. She's, uh, got decent striking ability. And if Dumont cannot put her on her back, she's probably going to eat a lot of strikes. Um, Anderson is one of the biggest, uh, most dangerous featherweights in the world. And, uh, Dumont is a talented grappler. I mean, you look at her record and she's got a few uh, submission victories out of those uh, four wins so far. So she's really a, a talented grappler. And if she can put Anderson on her back, we know that Anderson uh, has issues against uh, really talented uh, ground fighters. You saw that in uh, her most recent loss. Uh, that being said, Anderson also does have a little bit of a, uh, She's been improving a little bit with her ground, um, actually pulled off a triangle choke. So uh, I still don't think that she would be able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Dumont if it goes to the canvas. But that being said, um, Anderson is very strong physically. I think that she'll be able to bully Dumont, who's, I think, going to be about uh, seven inches shorter, at least five or six inches shorter than Anderson. And... Uh, I think that she'll just outstrike her over the course of three rounds, if not potentially pick up a TKO, especially with uh, Dumont having not fought since August of 2018. So a year and a half since she's competed. So I'm going to side with Megan Anderson. I think that she either wins a decision or a TKO. Now, moving up to the light heavyweight division, we have Ion Kutalaba, who is 15 and 4, taking on Magomed Ankalaev, who is 12 and 1. Now, Nick, what's the MMA odds maker's perspective on this one? Ankalaev minus 400, Kutalaba plus 300. That was the opening line. And right now, what we're seeing over at DSI is currently Kutalaba still obviously the underdog plus 179. Ankalaev right now is a minus 217. So minus 217 plus 179. The line has dropped obviously from 400 to about 200 cut in half again as the Anderson fight where we were just talking about. That line definitely was a high opener. There's no doubt about it. I mean, Kutalaba is a very talented fighter and he should not be plus 300 against Ankalaev. I understand Ankalaev is, is very solid as well. He should be deserving a favorite in this fight, a slight favorite. I think the line is a far more appropriately set right now. It should be even tighter, to be honest with you. Uh, but, I mean, looking at the matchup, both these guys are good strikers. That's Kudalaba's path to victory, though, is out striking, trying to do some damage along the way for Ankalaev. Ankalaev can mix things up a little bit more. I mean, he definitely has that diverse striking set, uh, skill set that's really fun to watch, but he also has some wrestling to back that up, and he could try to grind Kudalaba out. So he does definitely does have the advantage in this fight and should have the edge if he does hit the scorecards, especially. He should be able to grind out probably two out of three rounds from Kudalaba, but Kudalaba, again, you can't sleep on this guy. He's getting better. He is definitely one of the best out there right now. And with his improvement and with his skill set overall, his takedown defense continues to improve. But he can be put on his back. And as the fight progresses, obviously, it's harder and harder to stuff some of those takedowns. I mean, I, I know it's difficult for the wrestlers and those types that to get him, but 
it's just as hard stuff at times as well as, you know, the fight progresses and everybody's getting a little bit more tired. So I think Ekolaf edges it out, but again, it's a dog or pass situation. I mean, Kudalaba could easily steal this fight on this cards as well. Maybe he does edge out two, three round, two out of three rounds, keeping this fight upright enough and out, out striking Ekolaf enough on the feet, doing more effective damage. So I could see him pulling off the upset on the cards, but I think a better path of victory for Kudalaba is maybe knocking, not knocking out Ankolaev and winning it that way. So Ankolaev, Probably edges us out in the cards. I'm going to pick him to win, but it's another dog or pass situation in this fight. Yeah, Ankolaev is the more technically sound fighter here. He's also the more well-rounded fighter, but he could be uh, punished for uh, not being as active of a fighter. Um, Ankolaev lands more often. He's better defensively, um, but uh, Kutalaba throws and lands about twice as often as Ankolaev does. So in a pure stand-up fight, while I can see Ankolaev, uh landing uh, at a more, at a higher rate during the fight, uh, Kutalaba could make up for that by just pushing forward aggressively, winging bombs for three straight rounds. And he can do that. I mean, he, he can go. Um, that being said, um, what really separates these fighters is, I think, uh, the ground game. Uh, Kutalaba will mix in takedowns, and he's actually a little bit more aggressive in looking for takedowns, but his ground game isn't nearly as good as Ankolaev's is. And while he does have good takedown defense, um, when he does get put on his back, that's where he can get exposed. Um, he can be submitted there. He can be controlled there. It's just a matter of getting there. And I think Ankolaev... Uh, mixes in some very good wrestling with some extremely good uh, technical striking ability. So uh, the way I see this fight playing out is I think uh, Kutalaba will make up for his technical uh, lack, his uh, technique disadvantage with volume and aggression. And uh, the standup should be pretty evenly matched. Um, and either guy could win. Uh, Kutalaba has an iron chin. Um, so, uh, I think it would be to Ankolaev's advantage to look for takedowns in top position and to use some of his wrestling because I do think that he's the better wrestler of the two. And if he can mix in takedowns with uh, an evenly matched stand-up game, that should be enough for him to win. But I am a little bit concerned if those takedowns don't come and Kutalaba just keeps winging for three straight rounds. Uh, we've seen Ankolaev... Uh, you know, make a few uh, mistakes in the past, especially, you know, the, the Paul Craig fight. So um, I think uh, it's Ankalaev's fight to lose, but he could lose it, but he will be my pick. Now, moving on to the co-main event of the evening, we have Felicia Spencer, who's seven and one, taking on Zara Fairn, who is six and three. Now, Nick, where did this fight open and how has the public shifted things so far? Spencer open minus 625, Farron plus 450. And right now what we're seeing over at DSI is minus 769 for Spencer. Farron is at plus 529. So line margins have tightened up more action coming in a little bit Spencer's way. A lot of people throwing their base as well. I won't waste a lot of time in this fight because it's pretty clear cut. I mean, Spencer, even though she does have a stand up background as well, she, she excels to me and especially in this spot on the ground. I mean, she can wrestle. She has some mission game to go along with it, despite the Taekwondo background, like I said. So she's a pretty complete fighter, but in this spot here against Baron, she is not going to want to mess around on the feet. She's going to want to take this fight to the floor and basically finish it like she's capable of doing. So that's her path to victory. That's why people are parlaying her, and I think she does get it done. Farron, though, is getting better, man. I mean, I like what I see from her. She definitely has some skill. She's improving her ground game and her takedown defense, but it's just not going to be enough here against Spencer. So she has a shot on the feet. If she can keep it upright, she can do some damage, but I don't think she will. So the pick is Spencer. I understand why everybody's throwing their parlays. I mean, would I touch this fight? No, I'm, I'm going to stay away. I mean, it's if you're going to maybe look at a prop, depending on I – I haven't even checked out the props for this fight, obviously, because I'm not that intrigued. But, I mean, Spencer by submission or something like that, if you're getting – I mean, you're probably still going to have to – take a bad number in a way if you're going to do that because that's a, a real easy path to victory on the ground for her inside the distance or, or not so that's a way to bet this fight don't lay the chalk so the pick is spencer she probably does get it done inside the distance and i'm right with you uh felicia spencer is an extremely talented ground fighter she's been able to win fights with her grappling throughout her entire career um with quality performances um most recently against megan anderson uh, getting that uh, rear naked choke back in May. So she wasn't able to 
get things going against Cyborg. But, I mean, that was to be expected. I mean, she needed to take Cyborg down and submit her, something that no one's ever really been able to do. And I think, uh, you know, props to her for not getting finished by Cyborg more than anything. So, uh, this fight, um, she's facing somebody that definitely has some issues with her ground game. I mean, Farron is, uh, a dangerous striker. She's got some power. She's won a, a, a couple, uh, finishes with strikes. So, um, if, Spencer screws around on the feet. She could definitely lose a decision here or potentially get TKO'd, although I think that's unlikely since she survived against Cyborg. But uh, Farron basically is just not very good on the ground. I mean, she got tapped out by Megan Anderson, and that's just not something people would actually expect. And uh, while Anderson, you know, is long and lanky and was able to pull off a triangle choke in that fight... Uh, that's, I mean, if Felicia Spencer gets Farron on the ground, I mean, it is over. She is going to submit her. So I just trust that Spencer is going to get this fight to the canvas. And I think that she will, uh, win by submission most likely. But if she can't, um, Farron could pull off the upset and win a decision. But Spencer will obviously be my pick here. Now, moving on to the main event of the evening, the UFC flyweight title is on the line, but only for one fighter. Uh, we have Joseph Benavidez, who is 28 and 5, taking on Davison Figueredo, who is 17 and 1. Now, Nick, what's the MMA oddsmaker's perspective on this one? Benavidez open minus 165, Figueredo plus 135. And right now, what we're seeing over at DSI is currently minus 154, Benavidez plus 127, Figueredo. So solid opening line set. It's bouncing back and forth a little bit. Again, they're going to attract some two reaction here. Man, this is an interesting fight. I mean, if we're getting Benavides in his prime when he was fighting Demetrius Johnson in his prime, I, I know he still has a lot. What I'm trying to say is for the last few years, even though Benavides deserves to be in this title spot, I still think he's not performing quite as he was not long ago. So there's a little bit of a decline setting in for Benavides for me a little bit. Again, I mean, I don't want to, you know, sound negative here because again, he deserves to be in the spot, but that does have to play a factor in here because Figueredo is a beast of a fighter here. And I think he could do some serious damage on the feet if he's able to keep it upright. So Benavides here, even though he is a very good striker offensively, man, he's fun to watch Has speed has power. Obviously he's smart, um, but the wrestling is what he's going to want to use here and try to actually a backpack Figueredo as much as he can and, and, you know, obviously use kind of the style Formiga did against him to, to get the W there. But Benavides isn't really that type of fighter. So I think Figueredo is going to stuff enough takedowns along the way here, keep this fight upright and do some damage. And I think he is the more dangerous fighter. He is confident right now. As Brian mentioned, he did miss weight, which is disappointing because he's not going to be able to win the title if you, even if he wins his fight. Um, but that said, I just think the way he matches up right now in, in 2020 with Benavides, he could probably get it done. So it is definitely a dog or pass situation for me at this point. So it all depends. I mean, will Benavides fight as smart as he possibly can and not take too many risks on the feet, try to get this fight to the ground? I mean, he has – Figueredo has a dangerous guillotine choke, but those obviously those Team Alpha Male guys know all about those dangerous guillotine chokes. They do as well. So that's interesting. But outside of that, Benavides should have the ground advantage in his spot. So – should be an interesting fight. Uh, I think it has fireworks written all over it. And at some point, though, I think Figueredo probably catches Benavidez and hurts him enough to probably sway the cards for him and maybe get the cards that way. Or he finishes a Benavidez as well. So I do think we're going to see Figueredo winning this fight and not be crowned champion, unfortunately for him. But um, it's a dog or pass situation. Again, Benavidez is one of the best ever in the flyweight division, one of the best ever fighters at bantamweight and flyweight. I mean, back and forth, you know, his, his early career bantamweight was no joke at all. He was definitely competitive in that weight class as well. So Benavidez has been one of the best lighter fighters that's been in the sport for a long time now. And if he deserves, like I said, to be in this spot and he deserves the belt, to be honest with you. So if he gets it, I'll be happy for him. But that said, I think this is a crazy spot for him, and I think Figueredo does pull it off. So the pick is Figueredo, and it's a dog or pass situation for me. And I'm going to come in on Figueredo as well. Uh, Benavides is entering this fight with a lot of momentum. He's won uh, three fights in a row, impressively uh, finishing uh, Formiga and Alex Perez along the way with a decision over Dustin Ortiz. Um, I mean, he's beat the who's who in the division other than, like, Demetrius Johnson pretty much. Uh, you know, he beat Bagotinov, he beat Moraga, he beat 
Elliott. He beat Cejudo barely. I mean, you can argue that one if you want. But, I mean, he's pretty much beat the the best of the best in the flyweight division. And uh, that rematch performance against uh, Formiga was very impressive. And uh, you have to give him credit there. Uh, you know, because Formiga was on a run. Formiga even beat Figueredo. So, uh, that being said, uh, the way Formiga was able to beat Figueredo was with just constant attacks on the ground. Really good pressure, getting top position, attacking to the back. And Formiga is about as good at that, at that as any fighter in the flyweight division. And while Betas does come from a pretty strong wrestling base, um, and, you know, that is where, uh, you know, he's, his talent in MMA even is the foundation. His wrestling really is not that great. He does shoot for takedowns every once in a while, but I mean, more than anything, he's got a good guillotine choke. And, uh, other than that, I mean, he doesn't really get a lot of top position unless he hurts somebody on the feet first. I mean, he's usually looking to, to strike and do damage with his hands and he does have power in his hands, but that also comes with a negative because he doesn't have, uh, you know, the most, the best durability anymore. Uh, obviously we saw him get knocked out way back in the day by, uh, uh, Demetrius Johnson, but we've seen him rocked against Cejudo. We've seen him, uh, hurt in, uh, multiple fights. Uh, and then also lose on that decision to Sergio Pettis. Uh, again, that was off of, uh, after hurting his knee, his first fight back. But, uh, you factor in that hurt knee though. And I think that takes away a little bit of the explosion that he's going to need if he wants to utilize the ground. So I think this is going to boil down to who's the better striker. And I think Davis and Figueredo is the better striker. I think, uh, while Benavides does potentially have the more, the better pure power, I think Figueredo just strikes together better. Benavides is looking for that one big shot. And Figueredo, meanwhile, is going to be piecing him up a little bit, kind of like Sergio did. So uh, I think, unfortunately, because Figueredo missed weight, that we will not be crowning a flyweight champion. And Figueredo will win this fight. And I don't know what will happen after that. But... Uh, I am going to pick uh, Davis and Figueredo to walk away with uh, the main event victory. So that'll do it for our full event breakdown for UFC on ESPN Plus 27. If we have a free play to give out, make sure to follow at MMAOB Premium on Twitter because that's where we post them first. We can also notify you of our free bets via email alert if you prefer that method. Just send an email to picks at MMAOddsBreaker.com and we'll add you to our free bet mailing list. Special thanks to BetDSI. Good luck, everyone, and hopefully the betting gods are on your side this weekend.